Marxism and the Oppression of Women, Part 3, The Socialist Movement. Chapter 7, The Second International. In the quarter of a century that preceded World War, a powerful working class movement, represented by trade unions and socialist parties, arose in virtually every European country. The new working class parties shared a commitment, however abstract, to the eventual transformation of capitalist society into classless communism. At the same time, they fought for the extension of suffrage to workers and sometimes to women, ran impressive and often quite successful electoral campaigns, and pushed legislation to better working conditions and ensure people working against sickness, disability, and unemployment. Above all, they encouraged the organization of workers into trade unions to bargain directly with employers and, if necessary, strike. Chief among the socialist parties stood the German Social Democratic Party, the SPD, presumed heir to the mantle of Marx and Engels, leader of the German trade union movement, and able, at its height, to boast of four and a half million votes and over one million party members. By 1889, the foundation had been laid for the Second International, a body that sought to coordinate discussion among and action by the various national parties. In theory, socialism and the goal of a classless communist society constituted supremely international tasks, the more so as capitalism developed into a full-scale imperialist system. In practice, the individual working class movements and their parties responded to conditions of an essentially national character and generally trod along separate, if parallel, paths. When war broke out in 1914, these paths diverged. With a few important exceptions, the international splintered along the lines of opposing armies. For the socialist movement, the problem of women's oppression was, in principle, an inseparable part of what was called the, quote, social question. Socialist parties took up the so-called woman question in party newspapers, and also produced a modest amount of theoretical and agitational literature. With some reluctance, they incorporated women's political rights in their programs, sought to build mass women's movements, and encouraged trade unions to organize women workers. Despite weaknesses, the socialist movement offered the most sustained and thoroughgoing support then available to the struggle for sex equality and women's liberation. At the same time, examination of some examples of party literature on the woman question suggests that, for the most part, the Second International failed to clarify, much less extend, the incomplete legacy of theoretical work left by Marx and Engels. Moreover, by codifying and in some measure sanctifying this legacy, the socialist movement actually hampered its ability to move beyond inherited ambiguities. Among party and trade union militants able to find time to read socialist books, Woman and Socialism, by the German Social Democratic leader August Bebel, ranked first in popularity. Originally published in 1879, by 1895 it had gone through 25 editions, and by 1910, 50, not to mention numerous foreign translations. For years, Woman and Socialism was the book most borrowed from workers' libraries in Germany, and it continued to serve as a major socialist primer into the first decades of the 20th century. What was it that so persistently drew workers and socialists to a book nearly 500 pages long? In the first place, Woman, as the German movement dubbed the book, was virtually the only work in the Marxist literature of the period that spoke to people's desire for a detailed and specific picture of the socialist future. Scanning the oppressive past and dissecting the capitalist present, the book also devoted whole sections to sketching the general outlines of what life in the socialist society to come might be like. It is quite safe to say, observed a library journal in 1910, that it was from this book that the proletarian masses derived their socialism. End quote. And years later, a party activist reminisced that, quote, For us young socialists, Bebel's book was not just a program, it was a gospel. End quote. Until the Bolshevik Revolution opened up the possibility of a real-life example, Woman, 
offered the most developed vision of what socialists were fighting for. Footnote. On the popularity of Babel's book as a vision of socialism, see Steinberg. End footnote. But the book was not just about socialism. It was also about women. Woman in the past, present, and future, as the title of the second edition announced. For some readers, it documented the anguish of their own experience as women, inspiring hope and joy to live and fight. With these words, Ottilie Bader, a working-class woman, recalled the impact the book had on her when she encountered it in 1887 at the age of 40, living, quote, resigned and without hope, under the burden of, quote, life's bitter needs, overwork, and bourgeois family morality. Beginning of long quote. Although I was not a social democrat, I had friends who belonged to the party. Through them, I got the precious work. I read it nights through. It was my own fate and that of thousands of my sisters. Neither in the family nor in public life had I ever heard of all the pain the woman must endure. One ignored her life. Babel's book courageously broke with the old secretiveness. I read the book not once, but ten times. Because everything was so new, it took considerable effort to come to grips with Babel's views. I had to break with so many things that I had previously regarded as correct. End quote. Bader went on to join the party and take an active role in its political life. For certain militants within the German Social Democratic Party, the publication of Woman and Socialism had a further meaning. Clara Zetkin, for instance, observed in 1896 that Babel's book, irrespective of any defects, quote, must be judged by the time at which it appeared. And it was then more than a book, it was an event, a deed, end quote. For it provided party members with a demonstration of the relationship between the subordination of women and the development of society. Zetkin interpreted the publication of Babel's work as a symbol of the party's practical commitment to developing women as socialist activists. For the first time, she noted, from this book issued the watchword, we can conquer the future only if we win the women as co-fighters. End quote. As woman progressed through edition after edition, Babel continually revised and enlarged its texts. The first edition, totaling only 180 pages, and not subdivided into chapters, appeared just after the German government attempted to crack down on the growing socialist movement by banning the SPD and instituting severe censorship. Despite the book's illegal status, it sold out in a matter of months. Not until 1883 was Babel to locate another publisher willing to produce the book, as well as find time to expand and revise it. In an unsuccessful attempt to get around the anti-socialist laws, he retitled the 220-page second edition, Woman in the Past, Present, and Future, a change corresponding to the new chapter structure. Although the authorities nevertheless banned the book, it was once again an immediate success and quickly sold out, as did six subsequent editions in the following years. In 1890, the anti-socialist laws were lifted, and Babel prepared a substantially reworked ninth edition, which appeared early in 1891. Rechristened Woman and Socialism, and expanded to 384 pages, the ninth edition also incorporated, for the first time, parts of Engel's analysis from the origin. It was this version of Woman, repeatedly reprinted, and in 1895 further extended to 472 pages for its 25th edition, that became the socialist classic. The German-speaking socialist movement thus had the distinction of producing two major works on the question of women's oppression within a span of only a few years. The first, Babel's Woman and Socialism, by a major leader of the powerful German Socialist Party. The second, Engels' Origin, published in 1884, by Marx's collaborator, now a tremendously respected but somewhat isolated figure living in political exile. Given the convergence of subject matter and politics in the two books, 
one would expect the voluminous correspondence between the authors to include a substantial exchange of views on the issues. Instead, a strange silence reigns, punctured by a few casual comments. On the 18th of January, 1884, Engels thanks Babel for sending him a copy of the second edition of Woman. Quote, I have read it with great interest, he notes. It contains much valuable material. Especially lucid and fine is what you say about the development of industry in Germany. End quote. On the 6th of June, he mentions the forthcoming publication of The Origin and promises to send Babel a copy. On the 1st to 2nd of May, 1891, he notes his desire to prepare a new edition of The Origin, which he did that June. Babel's letters to Engels mentions his own book only in the context of problems arising with the English translation, and do not refer to The Origin at all. Engels' letters to other correspondents document The Origin's conception, writing, and preparation for publication during the first five months of 1884, but say nothing about his opinion of Babel's work. The impression remains of a silent polemic between differing views. Despite his special relationship to the socialist movement, Engels probably judged it tactically unwise to do more than publish the origin and hope it would be recognized as a more accurate approach to the issue of women's oppression. Babel divides woman and socialism into three major sections, quote, woman in the past, woman in the present, and woman in the future. Most of the constant textual revision and successive printings consists of changes of a factual nature, made to deepen and update the arguments. Only the publication of Engel's origin required Babel to make substantial modifications, which he largely confined to the first section. In the early version of Woman in the Past, he had presented an abundance of ethnographic evidence in rather disorganized fashion, under the assumption that, quote, although the forms of woman's oppression have varied, the oppression has always remained the same, end quote. Engel's work made him realize the inaccuracy of this statement, and, as he later put it, enabled him to place the historical material on a correct foundation. Babel entirely recast the section in order to argue that relations between the sexes, like all social relations, quote, have materially changed in the previous course of human development, in even step with the existing systems of production, on the one hand, and of distribution of the products of labor on the other. End quote. With the aid of the origin, he was now able to present the ethnographic material in the context of a more systematic sketch of the history of the development of the family, private property, the state, and capitalism. These changes hardly affected, however, Babel's analysis in the rest of the book. Footnote. For the history of the early editions of Woman and Socialism, see Babel's Foreda zur neunten Auflage, dated the 24th of December 1890. The following discussion cites the easily available English translations of the 2nd and 33rd editions to stand for, respectively, the early version and the classic text of Woman and Socialism. The second edition is Babel 1976, the 33rd Babel 1971, cited hereafter as Woman. For a useful evaluation of Babel's work, see Evans, 1977. End footnote. The section, Woman in the Present, makes up the bulk of Woman and Socialism. It includes two long chapters on the current crisis of capitalism and on the nature of socialist society, the state in society and the socialization of society. These chapters, as well as the four sections that close the book, Woman in the Future, Internationality, Population and Overpopulation, and Conclusion, barely touch on the situation of women. In other words, despite its title and chapter headings, over a third of Woman in Socialism focuses on the larger, quote, social question. No wonder so many socialists read the book more as a sort of inspirational general text rather than as a specific study on the question of women. The strengths of woman and socialism lie precisely in its powerful indictment of capitalist society, and the contrasting image it presents of a socialist future. 
as detail follows detail and compelling anecdotes multiply. Babel assembles a mass of information on virtually every aspect of women's subordination and the social question in general. In capitalist society, marriage and sexuality have acquired a distorted, unnatural character. Quote, the marriage founded upon bourgeois property relations is more or less a marriage by compulsion, which leads numerous ills in its train. End quote. Sexual repression results in mental illness and suicide. Sex without love is also damaging for, quote, man is no animal. Mere physical satisfaction does not suffice. Where, quote, the blending of the sexes is a purely mechanical act, such a marriage is immoral, end quote. The counterpart to loveless marriages based on economic constraint is prostitution, which, quote, becomes a social institution in the capitalist world, the same as the police, standing armies, the church, and wage mastership, end quote. Women's presumed natural calling as mothers, wives, and sexual providers results in the discrimination against them as workers. Given the widespread employment of women, often under the most arduous conditions, it is easy for Babel to document the hypocrisy of such prejudice. Quote, the men of the upper classes look down upon the lower, and so does almost the whole sex upon woman. The majority of men see in woman only an article of profit and pleasure. To acknowledge her an equal runs against the grain of their prejudices. What absurdity is it not to speak of the equality of all, and yet seek to keep one half of the human race outside of the pale? End quote. Babel insists, moreover, that industrial development tends to free women. In general, quote, the whole trend of society is to lead women out of the narrow sphere of strictly domestic life to a full participation in the public life of the people, end quote. But so long as capitalism survives, woman, quote, suffers both as a social and a sex entity, and it is hard to say in which of the two respects she suffers more, end quote. Babel portrays socialism as a happy paradise, free of the conflicts that typify capitalist society, and only concerned with the welfare of the people. His comments are far more concrete and pragmatic than anything suggested by Marx and Engels. He envisions a society in which everyone works and all are equal. Democratic administrative bodies replace the organized class power of the state. Marriages based on free choice prevail offering both partners supportive intimacy, time to enjoy their children, and opportunities for wider participation in social and political life. Sexuality develops freely, for, quote, the individual shall himself oversee the satisfaction of his own instincts. The satisfaction of the sexual instinct is as much a private concern as the satisfaction of any other natural instinct, end quote. Amenities presently available to only the privileged few are extended to the entire working class. Education and health care are assured, as well as pleasant working and living conditions. Domestic labor is socialized, as far as possible, by means of large, hotel-like apartment buildings, with central heating and plumbing and electric power. Central kitchens, laundries, and cleaning services make individual facilities obsolete. After all, quote, the small private kitchen is, just like the workshop of the small master mechanic, a transition stage, an arrangement by which time, power, and material are senselessly squandered and wasted, end quote. At the same time, the darker aspects of capitalist society disappear. Sexual repression, prostitution, deteriorating family life, dangerous working conditions, inefficient productive methods, goods of low quality, divisions between mental and manual labor, and between city and country, and so forth. Above all, the individual has an abundance of free choice and develops himself or herself to the fullest in all possible areas, work, leisure, sexuality, and love. Throughout Woman and Socialism, Babel challenges the assumption that existing sex divisions of labor represent natural phenomena. 
What is natural, he says, is the sexual instinct itself. Indeed, quote, of all the natural impulses human beings are instinct with, along with that of eating and drinking, the sexual impulse is the strongest, end quote. Despite a fairly simplistic view of instinct, Babel's lengthy attack on the notion of eternally fixed sex divisions of labor stands out as an important political contribution to the socialist movement. For once a socialist leader confronted the ideological character of claims about the social consequences of physiological sex differences. With all its strengths, woman and socialism nevertheless suffers from a seriously impoverished theoretical apparatus, as well as various political defects. Babel's theoretical perspective actually consists of an eclectic mix of two major trends within the socialist tradition, trends against which Marx himself had often struggled. On the one hand, woman and socialism reflects a utopian socialist outlook, reminiscent of Fourier and other 19th century socialists particularly in its view of individual development within a communitarian context. And on the other, the book exhibits a mechanical and incipiently reformist interpretation of Marxism, thus heralding the severe reformism that overran most parties in the Second International by the turn of the century. Lacking an adequate theoretical foundation, Babel's discussion of women's oppression and liberation follows an erratic and sometimes contradictory course. From the start, he conceptualizes the issues in terms of the free development of the female individual. Quote, the so-called woman question concerns the position that women should occupy in our social organism. How may she unfold her powers and faculties in all directions, to the end that she become a complete and useful member of human society, enjoying equal rights with all? End quote. In the present capitalist society, stamps every facet of women's experience with oppression and inequality. Quote, the mass of the female sex suffers in two respects. On the one side, woman suffers from economic and social dependence upon man. True enough, this dependence may be alleviated by formally placing her upon an equality before the law, and in point of rights. But the dependence is not removed. On the other side, Woman suffers from the economic dependence that women in general, the working class woman in particular, finds herself in, along with the working man. End quote. Equality and liberation are thus always social as well as individual issues, and Babel hastens to add that the quote, solution of the woman question coincides completely with the solution of the social question. Incidentally, putting the final resolution of the question into the far future. Meanwhile, the working class, and not the bourgeois feminist movement, constitutes women's natural strategic ally in the struggle. Moreover, participation in the revolutionary movement enables, quote, more favorable relations between husband and wife to spring up in the rank of the working class in the measure that both realize they are tugging at the same rope and there is but one means towards satisfactory conditions for themselves and their family, the radical reformation of society that shall make human beings of them all. End quote. Insofar as Babel considers the social source for the pervasive oppression of women, he relies on the concept of dependence. In general, he asserts, quote, All social dependence and oppression have their roots in the economic dependence, of the oppressed upon the oppressor. End quote. Thus, woman's oppression is founded on her dependence upon men. Quote, Economically and socially unfree, end quote. in capitalist society, for instance, woman is quote, bound to see in marriage her means of support. Accordingly, she depends upon man and becomes a piece of property to him. End quote. If oppression has its basis in personal dependence, then liberation in the socialist future must involve the individual's independence. Quote, the woman of future society is socially and economically independent. She is no longer subject to even a vestige of domination and exploitation. She is free, the peer of man, mistress of her lot. End quote. 
Apart from carrying the bewildering theoretical implication that chattel slavery systematically characterizes capitalism since every wife must be, quote, a piece of property. Statements such as these show that Babel has lost touch with the essence of Marx's orientation. For Marx, class struggle within a specific mode of production constitutes the basis of social development. An individual oppression has its root, therefore, in a particular set of exploitative social relations that operate at the level of classes. Babel, caught up in the reformist tendencies of his time, replaces Marx's concept of class exploitation with the vague and far less confrontational notion of dependence, particularly the dependence of the individual on others. Social well-being is measured, then, by the location of the individual on a scale ranging from dependence to independence, not by the nature of the social relations of production in a given society. Similarly, socialism is pictured largely in terms of the redistribution of goods and services already available in capitalist society to independent individuals, rather than in terms of the wholesale reorganization of production and social relations. Despite Babel's commitment to socialism, his emphasis on the full development of the individual in future society recalls nothing so much as liberalism, the political philosophy of the 19th century bourgeoisie. It is the focus on individual dependence, viewed largely in isolation from the mechanisms governing social development as a whole, that undermines Babel's strategic perspective. In Woman and Socialism, woman's oppression is treated as an important but theoretically muddled problem, and it is hardly surprising that Babel comes up with a variety of implicitly contradictory strategic approaches. In the first place, he often insists that the complete resolution of the problem must be postponed to the revolutionary future, when it can be fully addressed in the context of solving the social question. Nevertheless, practical work on the issue remains critical in the present. At the same time, it somehow becomes subsumed in the working class movement's struggle against capitalism. Finally, Babel often pictures the solution to the so-called woman question in terms of achieving equal rights to participate in society without distinction of sex. This approach fails to differentiate socialist aims from the liberal feminist goal of sex equality in capitalist society. In short, Babel could not, despite his best socialist intentions, sufficiently specify the relationship between the liberation of women in the communist future and the struggle for equality in the capitalist present. He conceptualized the so-called woman question as an issue pertaining to women's situation as an individual, on the one hand, and to social conditions in general, on the other but he was unable to construct a reliable bridge between the two levels of analysis. The popularity of woman and socialism reflected the consolidation within the Second International of a definite position on the question of women. Engels' low-key and rather ambiguous opposition in the origin notwithstanding. Insofar as the socialist movement took up the problems of women's oppression, it spontaneously embraced Babel's analysis. In England, for example, Eleanor Marx, Marx's youngest daughter and an active participant in the British labor and socialist movements, wrote with her husband, Edward Aveling, a pamphlet entitled The Woman Question. First published in 1886 and reprinted in 1887, the popular pamphlet took the form of a speculative review of the recently published English edition of Babel's Woman. Its 16 pages represented, quote, an attempt to explain the position of socialists in respect to the woman question, end quote. Like Babel's Woman, the woman question focuses on issues of love, sexuality, and human feeling, while at the same time challenging the supposedly natural character of woman's place in social relations. As for the source of women's oppression in capitalist society, the authors repeatedly insist that, quote, the basis of the whole matter is economic. But they hardly offer any exposition of what they mean. 
The implication is, however, that they follow Babel in pointing to women's economic dependence on men as the essential problem. In a future socialist society, by contrast, quote, there will be equality for all, without distinction of sex, and women will therefore be independent. Equality, in the sense of equal rights, constitutes a major theme throughout the woman question. Unlike the feminists, the pamphlet claims, socialists press beyond the concept of equal rights as a, quote, sentimental or professional issue, for they recognize the economic basis of the woman question and the impossibility of resolving it within capitalist society. The woman question strikes a new note when it openly argues that the position of women with respect to men parallels that of men with respect to capitalists. Quote, Women are the creatures of an organized tyranny of men, as the workers are the creatures of an organized tyranny of idlers. Women, quote, have been expropriated as to their rights as human beings, just as the laborers were expropriated as to their rights as producers, end quote. In short, both groups have been denied their freedom. With such formulations, the authors conceptualize oppression primarily in terms of lack of political rights and the presence of hierarchical relations of authority. Moreover, the idea that women's situation parallels that of workers suggests a strategy of parallel social struggles for freedom. Quote, Both the oppressed classes, women and the immediate producers, must understand that their emancipation will come from themselves. The one has nothing to hope from man as a whole and the other has nothing to hope from the middle class as a whole. End quote. Despite the pamphlet's socialist stance, its images of parallel denials of rights and parallel movements for liberation come quite close to liberal views of purely political freedoms in bourgeois society. This explicit emphasis on the parallels between sex and class oppression takes a logical step beyond Engel's origin and Babel's woman. In the origin, the parallelism had remained latent in the series of dualities Engels had used to frame his arguments. Family and society, domestic labor and public production, production of human beings and production of the means of existence, equal rights between the sexes, and legal equality of the classes. In Woman and Socialism, Babel often counterposed the woman question and the social question, ambiguously according them equal weight as either separate or, paradoxically, identical questions. Moreover, in arguing that, quote, women should expect as little help from the men as working men do from the capitalist class, he implicitly postulated a strategy of parallel social movements. The notion of a theoretical, and strategic parallel between the sex and class struggles obviously had a certain currency within the Second International. While the woman question represented one of the first clear formulations of the position, socialist theorists and activists had evidently already adopted its substance, and it quickly became a staple of the socialist heritage. Babel's Woman and Socialism in the Avelings, The Woman Question, may be taken as indicative of the dominant views within the Second International. To the extent that the late 19th century socialist movement took up practical work on the issue of women's subordination, these views generally underlay the programs and tactics that were developed. All too often, the movement offered a perspective on women's oppression that combined visionary promises of individual sexual and social liberation in the distant socialist future, on the one hand, with an understanding of equal rights as an immediate but possible bourgeois goal on the other. In this way, the Second International left a legacy of theory and practice on the so-called woman question that tended to sever the struggle for equality from the tasks of revolutionary social transformation. End of section.